Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we will be exploring emotional sensitivity and its relationship to psychic functioning. My guest is Michael Jower. He is author of The Sensitive Soul, The Unseen Role of Emotions in Extraordinary States. He is also co-author with Dr. Mark Mikosi of Your Emotional Type, Key to the Therapies That Will Work for You, and The Spiritual Anatomy of Emotion, How Feelings Link the Brain, Your Body, and the Sixth Sense. Michael lives in the Washington, D.C. area, and now I'll switch over to the internet interview. Welcome, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with you. Jeff, it's a pleasure for me as well. We're going to be looking at emotional sensitivity and its relationship to psychic functioning. I think it's uh, sort of an overlooked field in spite of the fact that when you look at the word telepathy, uh, it by definition implies some kind of an, an emotional exchange between people. Yes. Uh, you know, when I was first researching this uh, this whole area, uh, I came across a talk that uh, one of your guests, uh, Dr. Bernard Carr, had given to the Society for Psychical Research in the UK back in 1985. And uh, I had my suspicions that emotion, as he put it, the title of his talk was uh, the psychic trigger question mark. Well, I thought that it very well might be. Uh, so it's certainly been bandied about uh, in um uh, these circles, folks that are interested in anomalies and anomalous perception. Uh, and in fact, uh, another interesting um, fact is that uh, back around, uh, I guess, the turn of the 20th century, the most famous mediums, the folks who uh, seem to have these telepathic traits uh, developed pretty highly, they were known as sensitives. So um, that was the term that was used. And my other, you know, parallel interest is is sensitivity. Um, the physical sensitivities that seem to go along with the emotional sensitivities, especially in people that seem to have psychical predilections or talents. Well, it's fascinating and to me in the sense that mainstream psychology has by and large brushed off parapsychology is uh, not of interest to them. Many psychologists still think, in spite of all the evidence, that parapsychology is a pseudoscience, but they do a lot of research in the areas that you've looked into, emotional sensitivity. Yes, it's not just psychologists, it's also increasingly neuroscientists. Um, one of the books that I've really leaned on and, and cited extensively in my first book, which was called The Spiritual Anatomy of Emotion, is a book by a neuroscientist named Antonio Damasio called The Feeling of What Happens. And, uh, you know, he, like uh, many neuroscientists, uh, his central concern is consciousness uh, and uh, he got down to sort of the nub of the matter, which is feeling. Uh, the feeling of what happens is consciousness in shorthand, in his view. Uh, more recently, there's been a book, I think just maybe two years ago, by uh, Christoph Koch uh, called The Feeling of Life Itself. You know, and he's concerned with all aspects of the brain and especially, you know, the computational nature of the brain. But even he recognizes that the core of consciousness is feeling. And of course, psychology is, the, you know, the entire field uh, was founded, I think, uh, we go back to uh, to William James and so forth. It was really founded uh, on the presumption, uh, very firm evidence that disorders of feeling uh, cause neuroses and psychoses and so forth. So feeling does seem to be uh, central to who we are as human beings. Well, we have a, a mammalian brain. It's the, the feeling brain. And uh, it's, it's a very important part of, of the human psyche that it kind of gets overlooked, I think, uh, in the field of parapsychology, where we're much more focused on the cognitive side rather than the emotional side. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and my work, uh, I didn't really intend it that way, but I think it could be viewed as a corrective to, uh, just what you're pointing out is that, um, Psychology, uh, parapsychology, cognitive science, 
um, has all focused on the brain and cognition. Uh, and I think that short changed what underlies cognition. When you talk about, you know, the evolution of human beings, the evolution of the brain, uh, you know, there, there's the reptilian brain, which is the, the oldest part of the brain, the sort of reflexive capacities that we have. And then built on top of that uh, is the limbic system, the emotional brain. Uh, and on top of that is, is the uh, neocortex, the thinking brain. Uh, and I think people like Damasio have demonstrated conclusively that um, you really need to be able to feel before you can think and that feeling informs our thinking. Uh, you know, we, we would be uh, robots, automatons if we didn't have feeling. That's really what makes us human. And the shades of feeling and the, the idea of uh, uh, in any given situation, you know, we're feeling our way through it and, and our remembrances and uh, what's important to us, what we believe, what we strive for is all colored by feeling. Uh, that really is the bottom line reality. And uh, I, I, I do believe that psychology, parapsychology, cognitive science has, has glossed that over to its detriment. You write, for example, of uh, unusual individuals who have extraordinary emotional sensitivity. Uh, some people can walk into a room and immediately gauge uh, the emotional uh, state of other people in the room instantly. I, it, to somebody like me, that seems almost miraculous. It's, it's pretty incredible, uh, although there are probably more people with that capacity than we might imagine. Uh, and here, I think what's been very helpful for me as I've proceeded with my research and writing is uh, a concept called the, uh, the boundary spectrum, thick and thin boundaries, which is a concept propounded by uh, the late Ernest Hartman of Tufts University. And I was fortunate enough to get to know Ernie uh, I always called him Ernest, but I think his, his, his uh, longest friends called him, called him Ernie. Uh, but we would correspond. We would talk a lot on the phone. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him once up in Newton, Massachusetts, where he lived. And um, he was a psychiatrist who uh, really developed the idea of a spectrum, that there are certain people that are highly thin boundary who are the types that uh, have these instantaneous impressions of pretty much anywhere they go. And, you know, they're highly reactive uh, they're open to experience. They score very high on that uh, uh, psychological measure, personality measure, openness to experience. Uh, they see shades of gray, uh, to say something that's sort of uh, obvious for somebody like that. They're, they're preoccupied with feelings, and um, they often ruminate on their feelings. They have very uh, colorful, memorable dreams uh, that, that reflect their feelings and so forth. And then you have the spectrum all the way to the thick side. And thick boundary people, whom Hartman also studied, uh, are people who, uh, for whom feelings are really sort of a foreign language. They're they're rather impassive or stoic. Uh, they're highly organized. They're very precise. They divide things into categories. Well, as, whereas the thin boundary people, uh, you know, impressions spill over, and categories don't mean nearly as much. And the thick boundary people aren't as nearly as conversant with what they're feeling. They may have a sense for things, but they may not know exactly why or how they've arrived at that sense, whereas the thin boundary person will talk your ear off about it. So this, this spectrum of boundaries, uh, I think, has been very useful for me in my research to identify people who, um, it turns out the thin boundary people, of course, are, are more psychically attuned. They seem to rely on this um, strong sense of, of what's going on in the feeling realm uh, to gather some very unique, different sorts of impressions than other people along the boundary spectrum would ever guess at. Now, I know there's some fascinating research that uh, shows that people who report a lot of spontaneous psychic experiences tend to have had uh, emotional and physical abuse as children. And uh, you write about PTSD, which is related to that sort of thing. It, it, sometimes people with PTSD get just flooded with emotion. Yes, yes. And uh, it's interesting. There are two kinds of PTSD, uh, which I discuss in, in the new book, Sensitive Soul. And I certainly wasn't aware of this until I delved into the research. But there's very good evidence that uh, I believe 30 to 40 percent of people with uh, diagnosed PTSD have a dissociative type of PTSD, and that is um, 
uh, they're not exactly sure what's affecting them. You know, it feels probably like they're they're walking through soup or through you know a heavy fog. There, something's weighing them down. Uh, they're concerned about something. They're distressed to some extent, but they can't quite put their finger on it. They might feel somewhat depressed, uh, downcast, and that's a very different type of PTSD than the majority of people have. And I think the popular conception is sort of the the flashbulb memory. You know, a car backfires and the, and the soldier, the guy who was a soldier in Iraq um, during that war uh, reacts as if gunfire has just occurred. And he's back, you know, on the battlefield with all the sights and sounds overwhelming him that occurred at that time. Uh, so that's the popular conception of PTSD. And that is what affects most kinds of people. But I think it indicates, again, that if you take a given condition, there are different uh, uh, different uh, gradations, you might say, within that condition. And it just points up how uh, everybody has kind of a unique perception and window on the world. And I would argue a style of feeling all to themselves. So there's a lot to be learned as we look at different types of people with different kinds of conditions that, yes, plague them. And and unfortunately, you know, uh, we want to help them. Uh, but they're highly sensitive in many cases. And to me, sensitivity is a, is a window into the anomalous. And it's a window into things that we haven't yet explained uh, to our satisfaction. And the sensitivity, the high sensitivity that many people have and the emotional receptivity that they have, I think, offers a unique window into a lot of things that we haven't yet uh, comprehended very well. You also write about synesthesia and its relationship to emotional sensitivity that uh, some people will see colors. Well, everybody sees colors. Some people actually see sound uh, and emotions are that way. They express themselves. For some people, they might hear sounds in relationship to emotion or they might see colors in relationship to emotion. I think this has a lot to do with people who say they see see auras around people. It's a form of synesthesia, as best I can tell. Yes, and, and some of the parapsychological literature uh, backs that up. I think uh, um, uh, Carlos Alvarado and, and others uh, going back to perhaps the 1990s um, identified uh, or at least correlated the seeing of auras with, uh, with synesthesia. And uh, it's, it's a fascinating capability. I wasn't aware of it, Jeff, actually, until about midway through the environmental sensitivity survey that I did uh, back in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, uh, people who responded to that survey, uh, including uh, a friend of uh, uh, my wife's, uh, made it clear that that's what she had. And I said, what are you talking about? And it, it opened up just a, a remarkable vista on an incredible capacity that some people have. And um, many of uh, the synesthetes, when you talk to them, there's so, any number of varieties uh, under the sun. But, you know, the most common, of course, is, is uh, perceiving words and numbers in color. Uh, other people um, have uh, uh, colored associations with the calendar and with days of the week and so forth. That's sort of the most, uh, um, uh, I don't say popular, the most prevalent. Uh, but there are many other kinds of synesthesia. And as you point out, a lot of them uh, sort of have this emotional tint that, that people uh, who are synesthetic, when they hear about someone, when they meet someone, uh, or they conjure up somebody in their memory, there is a color that goes with that. And it seems to relate to emotionally how they feel about that person or the immediate impressions that they get. And, you know, it's, it's entirely automatic. Uh, synesthesia is a genetically inherited condition, I believe. Uh, it, it runs in families and uh, people uh, oftentimes uh, don't even know that the rest of the world uh, tends not to uh, be synesthetic until they reach a certain age and all of a sudden it dawns on them that people don't have the same perceptions, the same uh, color associations as they do and it's quite a shock. I gather that people uh, who are synesthetes uh, have perhaps a more complex nervous system, more neural pathways so that uh, they're able to, to generate these impressions that are uh, more varied than um, 
the average person who's not a synesthete, such as myself. Yes, yes. They uh, typically uh, become overwhelmed in uh, situations that for you and I would be kind of pedestrian. Going to the supermarket is a challenge for many synesthetes. Uh, just, you know, the, the plethora of impressions that, 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 that they gather, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the jostling, um, uh, just the whole range of impressions that they get. I don't even talk about going to Disney World or something like that. Uh, they can be easily overwhelmed and oftentimes are. They are highly sensitive people. Um, virtually every synesthete who's taken my environmental sensitivity survey uh, clearly, they're on the thin side of the boundary spectrum. And uh, as you point out, it's, it's the way they're wired. There are so many more neural connections. Uh, and, and this is apparently the way they come into the world. Now, what I gather uh, is that there's a pruning that typically takes place uh, when people are infants and as they're proceeding through childhood on up to and including adolescence. And uh, perhaps the pruning doesn't, for whatever reason, uh, proceed at the same pace for synesthetes. Uh, I suspect that for uh, people that are psychically uh, perceptive, uh, that have this uh, a different window on the world, that they may have these additional neural connections uh, akin to synesthesia. Ideally, if I uh, were a, a practicing psychic, and I'm not, I would want to be able to turn it on and off or up and down and at will and focus it here and there as I please and maybe block out some things that I don't want to have uh, come into my awareness and focus on other things that I do. But I gather that a lot of these people with highly developed sensitivities don't have that ability, and that's why it's troublesome for them. Yeah, it really is. And, and um, you know, the number of people uh, who have had lifelong psychical impressions um, who've said to me that um, my research has really helped them to realize that they're uh, not crazy and that there's a, a, a genuine emotional, biological, physiological, neurological basis for their impressions and that this is a great comfort to them uh, is very gratifying. Um, but you're right. I think that people are, are, are troubled as, as anybody would be. I mean, if somebody's got PTSD, for example, we talked about that, that's, that's certainly not, um, a condition you want to have perennially. Um, but I don't think it's, it's, uh, uh, these people's choice, the way they come into the world. It's, it's not just nature. Nurture has a lot to do with it as well. But uh, however it plays out, uh, people um, have these kinds of impressions, and uh, it's just part of who they are. And I think they just ultimately have to reconcile uh, that this is who they are and, and accept it and hopefully uh, uh, view it positively. Because I, I do think it's, it's simply um, a, a set of, uh, of um, aptitudes that some people have. You also write about savants and uh, prodigies of different kinds and uh, how their emotions are structured. Yeah, savants, uh, prodigies, um, there's, a, I, I gather, something of a thin line between them. Um, and it's very interesting because, uh, especially with, with the prodigies, uh, I'll just mention that for a moment, that um, uh, the folks I've talked to who work with prodigies, uh, there's a, a woman uh, who, would, Joanne Ruthsatz, Dr. Ruthsatz, who formerly, I think, was at Ohio State University when she was studying prodigies, and she said they are, to an individual, um, they have the most uh, uh, keenly developed sensibility uh, and, and wide appreciation of the way people are connected uh, and, and um uh, the feeling they have for other people and for events and occurrences in the world, it's, it's, it's very wide ranging and, and um, unusual, certainly, to say the least, for, for kids uh, of that age, you know, 6, 8, 10, 12 years old, uh, for the, them to have this, this highly developed sensibility. And they have, uh, in many cases, particular kinds of sensitivities uh, very strong memories, uh, apparently prenatal memories in some cases, uh, sometimes uh, memories that seem to uh, predate their birth. Um, so these sort of anomalies that, that um, attach the themselves to, to many prodigies. 
And then savants, the interesting thing about savants is that um, they typically uh, have had some sort of head trauma, uh, either directly or when uh, their mothers were carrying them. And that seems to be a recurring theme or some sort of um, a trauma around pregnancy, uh, lengthy pregnancy or conditions like preeclampsia that, that affect the pregnancy. Um, again, according to Dr. Ruth Satz, uh, to a much greater extent than you would, you would anticipate with just a regular person who's not a savant. Um, so there, there are certain commonalities, certain trends that seem to attach themselves to the, these kinds of people. And, you know, that's that's the sort of thing that I trace in the book Sensitive Soul, uh, trying to account for why certain people become uh, highly talented or have these uh, uh, sensitivities or sensibilities or uh, incredible capacities that the rest of us don't. When it comes to looking at the paranormal side of emotional functioning, the uh, I think the most striking cases that you write about are these children who seem to remember a previous lifetime. Uh, but even more striking is when uh, the lifetime gets identified by researchers and the, the details turn out to be correct. But even more than that, when you find that the, these young children have birthmarks that are associated with often the, the death wounds of the previous person, as if some strong emotion associated with a bullet or a knife uh, actually creates a you know, physiological feature in a young child. Yeah, it's it's absolutely astounding to consider this possibility, and there are hundreds uh, of well-documented cases, thanks to the late Dr. Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia, and uh, Dr. Jim Tucker, uh, who has carried on his work and does that to this day. Uh, there are really intrepid explorers, I mean, people that uh, have really tracked down, as you say, uh, and have identified in, uh, details of these cases that do seem to correspond to particular cases of people who got cut down through uh, some sort of trauma. Um, uh, they were attacked. There was some sort of, you know, unnatural demise that they went through. And the number that jumped out at me, of course, and any, I think everybody else who's, who's looked at this literature, uh, Tucker points out that uh, over the thousands of cases they've cataloged, uh, I believe it's 70% relate to some sort of violent or unnatural end to somebody's life. Uh, and and that's got to be hugely emotional. I mean, we talk about the fight or flight syndrome. When, when somebody's, you know, in uh, a life-threatening situation, all of their uh, systems are, are on high alert. Uh, you know, everything is is honed to a, to a knife edge. And I think, uh, again, sort of looking at um, uh, the body part of the mind-body equation, uh, and they're not separate. They're really two sides of the same coin. But, you know, I, I, I wonder and, and have speculated in, in this current book and, and previously what happens when somebody's in that uh, life or death situation. The energy that must be marshaled has got to be incredible. And, you know, emotions are really all about energy emotion. You know, they, they seem to have a very palpable um, energy and, and flow to them. And if you're in a situation where you, you can't escape uh, and and that person ends up dying, what happens to that, ener that energy? Um, I think of it as a vortex. Uh, and if you think of the conservation of energy, well, what happens to it uh, at, that, at that juncture? And I, I think that there is... Uh, uh, a likelihood that emotion uh, connects to space-time. And so the anomalies that seem to disobey, you know, our customary uh, expectations of space-time um, have been uh, conditioned by high emotion. That's, that's my view of things anyway. Well, I gather from your book that you don't necessarily equate these cases with reincarnation, although Stevenson and Tucker refer to them as cases of the reincarnation type. What you're simply suggesting is that one person emits a very strong emotion and then another person, a, a fetus or a child, somehow receives that and, and it affects the actual structure of their body in terms of birthmarks and deformities. 
Yes. I mean, literally, you have um, uh, trauma transmuted from one person in one locale to a nascent person in the womb uh, somewhere else, which just boggles the mind. But as, as I say, there's there's a very strong documentation that Stevenson and Tucker and others have gone to the trouble uh, of, uh, of, of putting on paper. And this, this spans, you know, 30, 40 years, I think, at least. Um, and this idea that I have is is not mine originally. I, I, I arrived at it without knowing that somebody else had. But I think one of the, the other researchers um, who's still around today, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, J- uh, Jürgen Kiel, K-E-I-L. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Apologies if, I, if I'm not. Uh, but he came up with the concept of thought bundles, um, which uh, it, it's kind of a, a passive term, so I don't really care for it so much because I'm, I'm really thinking about how the body and, and the mind are stuck in this uh, traumatic situation where, uh, you know, the person's going to be killed or is facing the threat of death. Uh, and that's got to be hugely anxiety and stress producing. So. Thought bundles don't seem to do it for me, but that was the term that he used. And and again, the idea is that there's some sort of transference, that this energy, the thought, the uh, the emotion, the forcefulness of, of what's going on in that situation somehow is conveyed um, across space time uh, and is available for another life form to commune with and somehow bring to fruition. And the interesting thing is these kids who have these these memories, some of them are prodigies, by the way, uh, which is quite remarkable. Um, There's a guy named David Henry Feldman who um, has written about this in in his study of of child prodigies. Um, It's called Nature's Gambit. I think it was published in the mid 80s and it's a sort of seminal work and, and a look at prodigies. And the interesting thing is that whether they're prodigies or they're just kids who don't have prodigious talent, they tend to forget uh, these these apparent memories when they get to around six or seven years old. So it, it, it seems like it's a transient phenomenon, but for the time that it's apparent, it's all consuming. Uh, the kids are absolutely overwhelmed and, and, and preoccupied with these recollections and often they demand to know more about who that person was. They don't necessarily believe that it was them, but they might view it as, you know, a a friend of theirs or somebody that they, they used to know. uh, And they want to identify who that person in that situation was. It's really uh, fascinating to consider why one person sometimes dying in another continent or a, a long distance away that the the energy and the physical structure of that person as they're dying gets transferred to a, a young infant or, or fetus over a great distance. Why that particular person? It certainly does, I think, make one suspect that there might well be something to the reincarnation hypothesis, although it's certainly a, a severe challenge to anyone who with a materialistic uh, metaphysical ideology. Yeah. Um, I think one um, recommendation that I have for research is to administer the boundary questionnaire uh, to these these kids, uh, and there's a short form, and it, you know it could be adapted, I'm sure, for ch- for children uh, or for young adults, uh, because my suspicion is that they are thinner boundary than than uh, other kids their age. That's simply a suspicion. It's a hypothesis. I haven't tested it, uh, but uh, one uh, study group that I think does shed some light on this. Uh, is uh, adults that have received um, heart transplants. And that's something that I address in my first book, The Spiritual Anatomy of Emotion. Uh, there's a researcher, the late uh, Dr. Paul Pearsall, who wrote about this and, and, and others. Uh, but uh, he's kind of where I, I got my information. Uh, he calls them cardiosensitives. Uh, the people who, and I, I'm 
trying to remember the percentages, but there's a certain percentage of people who get heart transplants. It might be 10% or 20%, uh, maybe that high, uh, that seem to have um, newly found likes and dislikes and recollections, very vivid apparent memories that correspond to the person whose heart they're the recipient of. Uh, so Pearsall and others studied these folks, and that was his term for them, cardiosensitives. Uh, and they do seem to be, although the, the boundary questionnaire wasn't a thing for him at that time, but they do seem to have particular kinds of sensitivities, allergies and, and, and different uh, physical sensitivities that go along with the emotional sensitivities that I've cataloged in, in my work. So it, it raises questions uh, that I think are fascinating, and, and my short form take on all of this, uh, it may be proven to be correct or incorrect or partially correct, is that uh, it's the thin boundary people who are the most receptive and uh, who have these vivid impressions about, um, as you say, you know, they walk into a room or they get a sense for a particular place or person or situation, uh, and they have anomalous impressions very readily as well. Uh, and it's the thick boundary people uh, who, when they're in an emergency situation, because they're not so conversant with what they're feeling in that uh, highly volatile life or death situation, their feelings go somewhere. <laughs> they certainly aren't expressed. They're not reconciled. And the feelings that they were not conversant with, I think, have a tremendous potency, is my guess. And that has something to do with... Uh, uh, with these in, incredible um, uh, stories and, and, and facts that have been documented over the years. I imagine that uh, many of our viewers would like to take that test, and it's available on your website, as I recall. I've taken it myself, and, and I'm, you know, slightly on the thin boundary side, but uh, certainly not at the extreme the short form boundary questionnaire, which is only 18 questions, Hartman whittled it down from, I think, 145 questions is the full boundary questionnaire. But the short form uh, is on a website called youremotionaltype.com. So if, if someone wants to go to youremotionaltype.com, uh, the survey is right there when you, when you get onto the main page. It takes about 10 minutes on average for folks to complete it. Uh, you just click your answers and it's scored automatically for you. And it gives you a sense of where you are on the boundary spectrum. And also, uh, as you wade a little bit further into that site, uh, which I put together with uh, Dr. Mark Bacosi, um, it's, it's our take on the types of um, illnesses and health conditions uh, that a person on the thin boundary side of the spectrum or a person on the thick boundary side of the spectrum uh, might be susceptible to because it's our hypothesis that there are kinds of um, illnesses uh, and health challenges that affect people depending on where they are, um, thick or thin boundary. Let's talk about animals. You've written quite a bit about emotional sensitivity in animals. And because animals don't have the cerebral cortex that humans have, their emotions must be much more pronounced. And of course, they have all sorts of sensitivities that humans do not have. Yeah, there are a tremendous uh, range of, of stories about animals. Uh, and I've gotten, uh, Jeff, very interested um, in, in animals and what they might be feeling over the last several years. Uh, there was a guy named Yak Panksep, uh, who did probably more than anybody else uh, to shed light on the feeling nature of animals. He was known as the rat tickler, <laughs> which sounds like he's somebody out of a Batman cartoon. <laughs> Who are you going after, Batman? The rat tickler. But that was his, that was his nickname. <laughs> and he got it because he and his uh, students tickled rats. Uh, they heard rats, uh, or, or there was something that tipped them off that rats might be emitting high-pitched squeals ultrasonic chirps um, when they were happy. And uh, so they conducted experiments on this. And indeed, uh, rats do seem to laugh. Um, and uh, as Panksepp put it, um, all the indications are that they love being tickled. So <laughs> that was just some of the research that he did. But he really 
uh, delved into the physiology and the neurobiology of uh, mammals. And uh, I believe he went so far as to say that um, as we learn more about how our animal cousins feel, we as human beings will draw a, a, a much closer bead on how, how we are structured and uh, the meaning of our lives. Um, and I really believe that. And, and animals uh, live life, as I put it, closer to the bone. They don't have um, the sort of rumination and the, the intricate kind of language that we do, at least verbal sorts of language. They can clearly communicate with one another and with us. Um, you know, our pets certainly make themselves well enough understood. But they seem to have a very um, fundamental emotional life uh, and, and not as highly developed uh, um, intellectual life. Uh, as as we do, and for that reason, uh, it's not surprising to me that that pets figure in many anomalous uh, uh, paranormal accounts. And my own family has uh, has I, I view it as a privilege that we that we've been privileged to uh, to be part of an equation a couple of times with pets that died. That in the immediate aftermath of their demise, uh, there were some strange things that went on in this household, which I. Uh, can't account for in any other way than to say it has to do with the emotional bonds, the emotional ties that we had uh, with um, uh, those cats. They were both cats. Uh, but certainly, you know, uh, people like Rupert Sheldrake, uh, who it's been my privilege to meet and correspond with, you know, he documents again extensively uh, accounts of, of uh, dogs that seem to know when their owners are coming home. And we all have heard accounts of, of dogs that trek across half the country to be reunited with their families. We don't know how they do it, but they they seem to have this capacity. And my uh, gut instinct is that it's it's emotional. It's tied to their emotional bonds with with their people. And of course, you know, you mentioned at the outset telepathy, uh, telepathic impressions that pathy, you know, pathos relates to feeling. Uh, so I think so much of what we take to be paranormal uh, or anomalous is uh, simply variations uh, on this uh, theme of intense feeling uh, that people and animals can have for one another. You point out that some animals, I think elephants in particular, are are able to pick up on a, a events that are highly emotional, such as the death uh, or uh, danger threats that could be many, many miles o away from where they are. There are just uh, some incredible stories, um, and we can call them anecdotes, and they, they are, but, you know, the compilation of these stories are, are data, uh, and, and uh, we ignore them at our peril. Um, a couple of stories that come to mind um, – uh, I, I believe it was Zambia. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, uh, in, in my book, Sensitive Soul, uh, I, I repeat this, this account of elephants who um, moved to the far reaches of the sanctuary, which they were located in, at the same time as um, other animals, other, of, others of their species were being culled. In other words, they were being, they were being shot and killed from helicopters. 90 miles away, and um, the account uh, was that they, they, they moved as far away as they could uh, when that killing spree was taking place. Uh, there's another remarkable account. I just finished a book uh, called The Elephant Whisperer uh, by a guy named um, um, Lawrence Anthony, who, alas, is no longer with us, uh, a real humanitarian and, and somebody uh, very dedicated to animal welfare also. And uh, he brought a herd of, of wild elephants into his uh, sanctuary called Tula Tula. I hope I'm pronouncing that right um, in South Africa uh, and became acquainted with them and has many interesting stories about them. Uh, and they really took to him. I think they, they realized that they had been saved. They would have been shot otherwise if he hadn't taken them in. And that herd flourished and doubled or tripled in size. Um, and then at a certain point, Anthony died. And um, those elephants, that herd, uh, I believe within a day, showed up 
uh, on his doorstep, uh, his doorstep uh, where his family lived. And uh, his brother, I think, said at the time, and his uh, his widow, that this was remarkable because the elephants had been gone for weeks or for months out in the bush. And uh, seemingly uh, simultaneous with his death, they made a trek back, uh, seemingly to pay their respects. I mean, it's it's either a remarkable coincidence or there's something more to it than that. And I suspect that the emotional connection, again, is paramount. As I recall uh, about that story, the elephants came back in a kind of procession led by a female matriarch elephant. Yes, her name was Nana. And uh, she was the first of the uh, um, of that group to really establish a connection uh, with Lawrence Anthony. Uh, there are other examples, Jeff, by the way, of of, of dolphins, um, orcas, uh, marine mammals uh, having apparently a similar connection with people and awareness of death. Very highly developed sensibility uh, to uh, to death and and. Uh, uh, that's as we might expect. If if animals do indeed live their lives closer to the bone, um, they uh, they may have a highly, much more highly developed awareness of life at a feeling level than than we typically do. Well, it reminds me now that we're talking about it of an episode in in my own experience when I was much younger. I uh, participated in a small psychic group called the New Frontiers Institute, where we would go into a, a group trance together and uh, do, I guess you'd have to call it group remote viewing together. And on one occasion, we decided, let's all go visit uh, the dolphins at uh, Africa Marine World USA in near the San Francisco Bay Area. And, uh, we're in a room together reporting our conversations, what we're experiencing. It's all being recorded. And the gist of it was we're in touch with a, a female dolphin named D or starts with a D and uh, she's cantankerous, separated from the other dolphins, won't cooperate with the trainers, is kept in a, a separate tank and wants us to help her escape. So it was such a vivid impression. We called Africa Marine World and to talk to the dolphin trainers. And it turned out they had a female dolphin that matched that description. Her name was Dondi. And uh, so we began to work with Dondi and, uh, we did ex experiments. The dolphin trainers were very open to this and uh, where we would give Dondi uh, telepathic signals to perform different tricks and we would videotape her doing this and it, it seemed to be quite accurate. And the upshot was we couldn't free Dondi, unfortunately, but she returned to the dolphin show with the other dolphins. Well, that, that's a remarkable experience, and I'm glad uh, you and your friends had that sort of communion. I think that's remarkable. Um, there are some terrific accounts um, in a book by um, a naturalist named Carl Safina. Uh, the book is called Beyond Words, and I believe it was a bestseller about three years ago. Uh, and he and I have corresponded a little bit. I've been very priv privileged in the course of my research to reach out to a a wide range of people in a whole variety of fields. And when I read his book, you know, there are re really striking accounts of dolphins and orcas and their interactions with people. And, and similar to yours, uh, 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 marine biologists and, and trainers of these animals have said at times that they felt like there's a beam of energy that comes from the dolphin or comes from the orca and sort of probes them. And they just have the people, you know, report it differently. But uh, at least in a couple of cases, they seem to be describing the same thing. So, um, you know, who's to say, you know, uh, they've evolved differently than we have. Certainly, there's a, a, a wide variety of, of life uh, out there. And, you know, we're just one species. Um, who's to say that another species doesn't have more highly developed capacities? Um and can feel more things. Um, I have a friend and, and a fellow researcher named Jonathan Balcombe, who's uh, written about um, animals uh, and their feelings and their different capacities. Um, and uh, I think he's brought up that, that same point is that 
certain kinds of other creatures, fellow fellow uh, animals, because we're animals too, uh, may have different shades of feeling, more highly developed feelings uh, that we can only guess at. Michael, your research suggests that we could learn a lot about uh, the vast ranges of, of the human mind just by getting more in touch with our emotions. There are broad possibilities for learning about ourselves and about other life. Um, and um, I, I think beyond that, um, there are uh, implications for the study of consciousness. Uh, for example, recently um, I wrote an essay uh, about uh, a, uh, an outlook or, or philosophy or, or hypothesis called um, panpsychism. Some people know it as cosmopsychism. It goes back to antiquity. I think the Greeks, at the very least, and probably other cultures as well, had the idea that uh, uh, the entire universe uh, is sentient. You know, that, that uh, the capacity for feeling or perceiving is at some, in some elementary fundamental way is, is part of the fabric of life and part of the fabric of the universe. And this is not known as, uh, as panpsychism or cosmopsychism. Today, when we read about it uh, in Scientific American or, uh, you know, it tends to be neuroscientists, there's a guy named Philip Goff um, who's uh, propounded this. And I, I've been fortunate to be in touch, and I think he's been a guest on your program. Uh, they almost always talk about it in terms of consciousness. It's a conscious universe. I think Dean Radin, even with the title of one of his books, is The Conscious Universe. And I think that's, that's true, but it's also misleading. I think fundamentally, consciousness is supported by feeling. You can't be conscious unless you're first sentient. You know, so if you're sentient, you have some sort of a division between you and everything else, you know, so you can be an individual and you can sense what's outside yourself and relate it to what's inside yourself and navigate your way through the world. So that is absolutely fundamental. And then, you know, feelings go on top of that. Um, what we feel again, Antonio Damasio, the feeling of what happens is, is central to our life. Christoph Koch, the, the feeling of life itself, that is so central so I think in some sense, uh, the idea that the universe is conscious is a little bit too advanced. I'd actually like to bring people back to the, to the, um, uh, the approach that, that we look at feeling. And especially when we look at, uh, at telesomatic experiences, at ESP type experiences, uh, apparitions, poltergeist type of phenomena, uh, meaningful coincidence, synch uh, coincidences, synchronicities, which, of course, Carl Jung was highly concerned with, with and Wolfgang Pauli, the physicist who worked with him on that. Uh, if you look at all of these kinds of occurrences, they seem to all relate to uh, emotion, to feeling, uh, to um, symbolism that relates to feeling. Uh, and I, I believe that this is a core part of the universe. It's it's part of the fabric of of what we're born into. So to me, cosmopsychism and panpsychism would be, uh, I think, more accurately trained on um, the feeling of life uh, as opposed to the idea of, of conscious experience relates more to our mental life, which I don't think is as fundamental. Well, Michael Jower, this has been a very profound conversation. You really have your finger on, on something very deep, very important, and, and often ignored uh, by us, particularly you know, uh, Western people in our modern busy world where we often shove our feelings uh, aside. Michael, I want to thank you very much for being with me today. Oh, Jeff, I've appreciated your wonderful questions and the opportunity to have a conversation with you. I look forward to future discussions as well, Michael. Same here. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.